What is going on, everybody? Hope you are having a wonderful week so far. Before we start the podcast, I say it every week, if you are not subscribed to this, I'd love it if you did. Um, or if you're not subscribed to my YouTube channel, hit subscribe, um, hit the notification button. I love it if you do that. It's the only thing I ever would ask you to do. Um, give us some reviews and stuff. And it just means that we can help grow this. The the guests can get bigger um, and we can kind of give give you guys some more interesting stories and some more education and insight to the to what we call the music industry this week on the podcast the one and only joel corey i've known joel from i think we worked out on the podcast since 2017 um and it's been amazing to see his career go from where i met him to where it is now to being one of the biggest selling dance artists in the world um his music has just reached heights that people dream of and he's gone from releasing records well his first five records went top 10 uk chart which is unbelievable um his record with m and ek is at 1.1 billion streams on spotify absolutely amazing It's, it's, it's doing crazy selling mad tickets all around the world and he's also one of the nicest guys in the industry works so so hard so, I'll stop rambling on. Without further ado, Joel Corey. Mr. Joel Corey, what is cooking? What's Mr. Up, good, bro? Mr. Good Looking. How's it going? <laughs> yeah, all good, thanks. I just uh, just landed back from Thailand, actually, so I've had a nice few days away in the sun. It's been been a nice little break to have in January as well. Mate, I swear you're always tanned. <laughs> <laughs> always oh, fucking mate. tanned. <laughs> I've been on the beach, bro. I've been on the beach all week, so... <laughs> <laughs> oh man how's life how's life yeah yeah life's good um you know like start of the year now kicking off 2024 um excited for the year ahead like last year was a lot um, yeah, a really great year for me so i'm just like ready now after like a little few weeks off from touring just to uh, attack this year and smash it do you try and take uh like regular time off i'm really bad at it to be honest with you like mm. um it's something that like my mum always says to me, like you need to have like a few days here and there. Even my management always like, let's just block out a few days in the diary here and there. But I'm like a proper workaholic, and yeah. I feel like to have a little break, I've I've really got to earn that break, and I just never let myself do it. What I tend to do though is like if I have a DJ set somewhere, um, and I get to have like a day or either side to chill, that's mm. when I'll do that, and that's kind of how I manage it. It's weird how a lot of us are like this. Where like, well, I, I can only talk about myself, but like, I know you're, you're like it. And I know a few, a few friends are exactly the same where it's like, although we're working really fucking hard, if we take a day off, we feel lazy. Yeah, totally. Like when I have a day <laughs> off, I actually don't know what to do with myself. Exactly. I, I almost feel guilty. Like, yeah. Um, but you know, like on this, on the, on, on the flip side of that, I know how lucky I am to do this yeah. job and to travel and to be able to say that I can just work hard on something that I love so much. Not a lot of yeah. people can say that. So I always, always remind myself that as well. I think, I think it's interesting, isn't it? Because we have the best jobs in the world. We work harder than most. And I'm just saying that like we generally do. I think, I don't know about you, but for me, is that always that constant? Like if I don't work today or if I take a day off, like I'm gonna lose the opportunity to carry on doing this do you ever get yeah, that a hundred percent and that's kind of what i meant by i almost feel guilty yeah. if i if i take time off because i think like um with this with this career like there's not really like a separation between work and mm. like i finished work now it's kind of all day long um you know there's always some messages to get back to some emails to get back to music to work on dj sets to prep there's always something you could be proactively doing um yeah. So when you do like try and take the time away from it, there's stuff always playing on your mind. Like I could be doing this, I could be doing that. Um, so yeah, I, I, it's difficult to properly ever take a break. <laughs> it's really tough, isn't it? It's really, really strange. It's, you've always been in the same mindset as well. I've known you, trying to work out how long I've known you for. And I'm actually going back to the, <sighs> I'm going back from when we first, Oh, where am I? I'm on your, I'm on your Spotify right now, and I'm yeah. going 
like back to the like the just one was that the first one that we did um yeah but we was like i was coming down to coming down and working with you build, building up to that so it was like 2017 i've got a feeling it was 17 i think it was 17 yeah um well yeah because we did that hurt yeah yeah feel this yeah 2017 fucking hell man was that the so, sofa that i was sleeping on behind you it literally is <laughs> <laughs> i, re- I, I talking- recognize the cushions <laughs> <laughs> i was talking to charlie t just a minute ago and we were talking about you and i was like yeah you actually slept on that sofa which is yeah. random but I, ever since i've known you since 2017 um you've always just been hustling so hard whether it's in your in your fitness days when you were doing like bodybuilding stuff um or when because whilst you, you were coming down here you were touring as like you were doing a lot of the like the more commercial kind of mm-hmm. clubs and the rounds around england and were you doing mallorca as well then yeah so I think um, you had a residency at the time didn't you then yeah i had my residencies in like xanti yeah. and malia and magaluf and, I, and like you said i was like slamming the sort of uk high street club circuit non-stop yeah you were slamming it you were doing like three four nights a week yeah I, yeah. ne- I never forget that. And and like, I think it's like, it's really easy. And I, I kind of want to go into, into deeper talks about it because obviously where you began to where you're at now is, is very different. And, and kind of, I think it's very easy for people to say like, oh, like you were on a TV show, if you know what I mean. You, you had mm-hmm. that kind of, that start into the industry and it made it easy for you and everything like that. It's utter bullshit. Mm-hmm. Like I've literally like you're one of the hardest working people I've I've known in the industry. That's like you came into the studio and with me and you you didn't know exactly what you wanted, but you knew mm-hmm. that you wanted to be one of the biggest artists in the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and it's now 2024, <laughs> and you're one of the biggest artists in the world. <laughs> <laughs> but like, I, I kind of really want to like go into that and and kind of like look more in depth that because i think it's very especially in the world that you're in which is in like the more commercial house world right like Mm -hmm, you're you're literally having number one records Mm -hmm. and it's very easy for people that aren't in the industry that kind of listen to your music they're like oh like joel blew up overnight joel didn't Mm -hmm. blow up overnight like no one blows up overnight we we all you and i know this in the industry but i kind of want to talk about like the working years of when you like had to work to fucking get to where you're at and and how that was and and kind of where did all of that come from really yeah i mean well i started djing i've I've been djing since i was 13 years old it was always my hobby growing up as a as a teenager you know i was joel the dj at school i started my own mobile disco company in my when i was a teenager and i was doing people's weddings and birthdays bar mitzvahs nans (laughs) 60 ifs whatever um the whatever gig that was available like i was i was i was i was there um and you know then i got onto sort of uh high street residencies in my early 20s uh, yeah. djing around london um as a resident club dj you know i was the first yeah. person in the club starting the music at nine o'clock you know all the way to the end of the night 3 a.m yeah. um and those years doing that really were actual crucial for me when I look back now is just um, getting the experience to play to like a wide variety of people on the dance floor and having to like get those DJ sets prepared with different genres of music. And I'm really glad that I came up that way through the club circuit. Yeah. Um, And, you know, I always just had that dream of like, how can I take it to the next level? And I was looking at other DJs and artists that were in the charts and touring the world and festivals and obviously you know, they had music out and had hit records and building their brands. And um, I just really, really had this like burning desire to follow that path. Um, and in the meantime, when I was doing my club sets, I looked at that as a way of just promoting myself. So if I could get my face on, you know, any flyer, any club flyer, yeah. any Facebook page, for me, that was just an opportunity to play in front of people to get my name out there, you know, pushing my SoundCloud mixes. Um, handing out CDs on the dance floor after sets um, and at the same time focusing on production and yeah. starting to put music out and um, just doing that for years and years basically um, and then obviously the TV stuff happened which definitely gave me a platform so when I was doing my 
um, club sets and residencies it up that level. So I started then doing my sort of guest DJ sets around the country off the back of the exposure. Yeah. And, um, yeah, just is, again, is that just... when you felt like things changed a little bit more or was there a, a change and then a dip? Yeah, there was definitely, um, a change at that point when the TV thing happened, it allowed me to tour around the country rather than just playing my residencies Locals. around London. Yeah. yeah. And you know, where I was the resident DJ, I was now going into the clubs as like the guest DJ and playing yeah. an hour and a half, two hours rather than, you know, the whole night. And, yeah, yeah. um, at the same time, you know, it built my social media following. So I was able to promote myself. Uh, promote my mixes, promote the music that I was releasing to a wide audience. And so I definitely look at that. I used that as an advantage to help um, with the exposure that I got to help just promote myself basically and start building yeah. my brand. But, you know, it wasn't all positive stuff because there is like a stigma that comes with doing um, that TV stuff, especially in the music industry. And that was always a challenge for me that I had to um, overcome. But I actually it gave me motivation to like work harder and, and kind of like, prove people wrong sort of thing. Mm. And, um, I knew that if I could just get the music right, I, I felt like I could take it further. And that's when I just was like focusing so much on the music in the studio, putting records out, um, learning the music industry as well, you know, going through different record deals and, <laughs> You know, all the good stuff and bad stuff that comes with that. And I never I, forget I, those conversations we had about that first deal you signed. Yeah. Oh, it was all a learning experience. I honestly think, like, when I speak to any artist, um, everyone's gone through that stuff. Dude. You kind of have to. You have to, you have to learn it. You know yourself, bro. Like, you, you kind of have to go through that. And everyone does. And every time you go through one of those experiences, you learn something and you grow and get stronger. I think it's really interesting now because I think what we're seeing now is... I totally agree with you. And I think it's so important um, that you go through that because I think you just learn more about the industry. And, and I think you, by the time you get to the level of where you or I are at, we we know a lot more about the industry. However, <laughs> the thing that really scares me nowadays is the artists that are taken on almost as like projects. Um, yeah. And as much as I really respect it as well, like it's scary to me because I'm, I, I work with somebody that's kind of in that same situation and to the point where they have a manager before they even have a record deal out. Mm. They have, have a record out. They have a PR before they even have music out. They have like agents before they even have yeah. gigs, if you know what I mean. And it's really interesting to see like working with somebody at this moment in time and they had their first release out last on friday and they had like front cover amazon playlist mm -hmm. they had like new music friday they had dance stuff on spotify they had like beatport number like 20 going mm -hmm. in and you're like all these things like on the first day of your career realistically yeah. the first day could you imagine that now it would just be like crazy to think that like somebody yes they they still have to put work in right like everyone yeah. has everyone has put work in at some point whether it's to get that manager whether it's to get that team whether it's to write records whatever but like that f first day you release records and that's the success that it has and yeah. the team around you and you don't have to go through all that shit i don't, I don't know there's like i know you mean you it, kind of sets, it sets the bar really yeah. high from day really one and then, high. and then um i guess you you kind of don't experience all the the grind to get those get those moments yeah so when you get them you might not appreciate the other side of it yeah i guess i guess but yeah i mean like you said like management and stuff i i actually was kind of self-managed and did everything myself until i actually had my first breakthrough yeah. track which was sorry yeah and at that point even when that first came out i was still self-managed and eventually i was like okay now i need to like find the team and get the team in place so I kind of did it that way around. Um, well, I, th I think you did it the way that it should be done, if I'm honest, to a certain extent, especially when you're... You... But again, it goes back to your work ethic, right? Like you were working so hard and you, you knew exactly what the goal was at mm -hmm. the end of the day and you knew what you needed to do. Like when we were writing records together, like we had the conversation multiple times, it's like you wanted to write more commercial records. You mm -hmm. wanted to might write records that reached out to the masses and... I couldn't do that at that time. And like, it mm -hmm. wasn't, it wasn't really 
my place to even try and do that at that time and it was time for like you to go and write them yourself and work with a team that can help you write them mm -hmm. and i think for me like you knowing that goal is so important to like yeah. know exactly what you want as an artist and I, and like i kind of want to go through the process of like how did it how did that even start to get in your head like what what was that yeah it's a really good point like I was very, very clear in my mind and focused of what I wanted to do and and, and where I wanted to go in industry. Um, laser, laser focused, almost obsessed. I would yeah. wake up in the morning, like my brain just buzzing with it till the, till the moment I went to bed at night. I just, I wanted it so, so badly. And I think um, that, that whatever that was inside me, um, I'm so lucky that I, that I had that you know I'm so glad and grateful that I had that inside me to just to keep pushing and pushing and pushing and like never ever taking no for an answer um, yeah. and even like I mentioned earlier like, sort of like some of maybe the the challenges I did face because of the way I came through it it was that constant thing inside of me driving to be like no you can do it like you can you can you, you can prove everyone wrong you can prove yourself you can do this and and um where did it come from <sighs> Oh, God. It's hard to like say exactly where it came from. Um, but I've always been a very like driven person since I was younger, even going back to when I was a teenager and doing my mobile DJ business. And, yeah. you know, I was like 15, 16 years old and, and just thinking about like gigs and, you know, bookings and, and earning money from it and promoting myself and getting my name out there. So I was even doing it all the way back then. I'm, I'm, I'm 35 this year. Yeah, and and I've I've still got it going inside me, and I, I've had that since I was younger. I'm not too sure where it came from, um, but obviously th there's a core love of DJing inside of me as well. Like as I said, it was my number one hobby growing up. When I got home from school, I was doing all I was doing was DJing, um, mm. you know, recording um, pirate radio mix shows every night, you know, DJ EZ on Kiss and all that sort of thing, and. Um, obviously different era I sound really old right now <laughs> uh, but you know I, I grew up DJing vinyl as well so I was part of that culture of yeah. every weekend with my pocket money going to the record shop hunting for vinyl uh, you know I played a lot of garage music when I grew up and I had a real love for actual DJing yeah. so um, I think that on top of a drive inside of me to be successful um, are the two things so that, that that core love of DJing and music and that drive of wanting to you know, take this as far as I can go, try and reach my potential and um, get my name out there. Those two things combined is, is just, it's always been inside me since I, was, since I was a teenager. It's amazing, man. And now looking at Sorry, which came out 2019? Yeah. 175, <laughs> 175 million streams. That's mad. And it's so funny with Sorry, because I, I just said, like, I grew up in Garage and playing vinyl. Sorry, the original by Monster Boy and Denzi was one of the first vinyl I yeah. ever brought when I was younger. And it was like my favorite garage tune growing up. So it's like, that one's really special to me because I love the original so much. And, and um, you know, my version of it, you know, obviously um, did really well and connected with so many people. So it's that one is, is, and it was my first ever hit record. So definitely has a place in my heart, that one. So talking about hit records, um, you've had multiple, but I wanted to stick on that. Sorry. Um, at what point did you did you notice a change in your career from like being the like guest appearance in Oceanas and prisons mm. and all of that around the Br Britain and kind of being known for like who you were at that time to then going oh shit Joel Corey is actually like DJ producer writing big records now and releasing big records like did you notice a change straight away from that sorry record or was it when Lonely came out or something like that, where it was like, yeah, yeah. Good question. So in 2019, I, the, that summer, um, the summer of sorry is what I call it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was, you know, I'd released sorry in April and I'd released it on perfect havoc who are independent label. Yeah. And, um, you know, we were, we were hustling at the time I was, a, I had a residency on kiss FM as well. So, you know, I, all my DJ friends, I was like, you know, please give this one a spin on your mix show and, you know, sending it to everyone that I could and just pushing and pushing and pushing and, you know, trying to get favours of people for little spins of the record and, and trying to get it out there. And it wasn't actually until June, which is a couple of months later, that it was actually really started bubbling. 
Yeah. Um, and that was the, the real start of summer. And I, I just headed out to like Zanti and Malia for my summer residencies. And I do remember this, like walking down Zanti Strip to my club that I was, that, that I had my residency at. And like hearing Sorry getting played on the strip in other venues, I was walking past them. And you can't understand, like for me, this was such a, even that was such a big thing. Cause that's the first time that one of my tracks was being played by other DJs, you know? Mm. And um, I'd always been like a resident DJ. So I was always the one playing hit records of other yeah, DJs yeah. and other abuse and other, and other artists. And suddenly it was my record that was going off more than anything in my sets. And it was just like, obviously magical feeling. Um, it, it felt like, oh my God, like this is what I always wanted to happen. Yeah. And then, you know, it, it was reacting and bubbling and bubbling. And then it started entering the charts. And then I was getting tagged in all these posts from like official charts company on Twitter and um, all these different stats and the record label ringing me every day saying, oh my God, like got added to this playlist and you could really feel there was an energy behind the record. Yeah. And at that point, Atlantic came in to sign the record, to upstream it, you know? Yeah. And then when Atlantic came on board, I was like, oh my God, like I've just got a major record deal here. You know, I'm working with Atlantic Records and when they got behind it, obviously, you know, they could take the song to the next level. And um, it just started flying up the main charts, man. And at that point, I was like, I think people started to put, oh, that's Joel. Oh, my God, that's Joel's track. You know, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. that's going off right now. It's, it's like becoming the song of the summer. And then off the back of that, I then got a new agent that started getting me onto some better lineups, some festivals. And I think at that point, you know, towards that summer, everything started to change. But like you just mentioned, I knew that I didn't want to be like a one hit wonder. And yeah. what I did next was the most important thing. Like the biggest pivotal moment of my career was what I did next. And I had Lonely ready to go, man. I remember walking into Atlantic Records when we were like talking about Sorry and like, um, you know, meeting the team. And I said, guys, I've got the next one already. And I opened my laptop and I played Lonely and I was like, this is the next record. And that was just as Sorry got signed, but I was yeah. prepared. I had the next one ready and um, had to wait a lot of time though until it came out. But obviously Lonely came out and went top five. And, you know, then I started being booked on like Jax Jones support tour, Sagala support tour. And this had definitely changed from like me just playing at all these high street clubs now being like an artist on these different tours and playing mm. festivals and, um headline shows so yeah it was definitely in that period of sorry to lonely where it, where it changed so now lonely's at 218 million streams which is on spotify that's absolutely wild um i'd actually done a, a session with harley like mm -hmm. two years before in this like tiny studio in london i can't remember who it was even with oh, really? i literally cannot remember she's great um, yeah she's amazing so 2020 I want to go through chromatically your career because each each kind of time there's a bit another big record and yeah. um, it's really interesting to do this. So lonely happened twenty twenty. Obviously twenty twenty was the year of what happened. Mm -hmm. um, how does that affect your touring? Obviously you st we all stop touring. Yeah. We know what happens. Um, but how do you pivot when you're like, okay, well I've got the biggest record, like. Lonely was one of the biggest records during COVID, right? Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. probably one of the biggest records at the time. But it's COVID, so you can't tour, yeah. right? So what do you do? <laughs> right, so at the time, I was on tour with Jack Jones. And, yeah. my, and this was like January 2020 or February 2020. I had my whole year planned out that year with all these gigs I was going to do, festivals, tours, like we'd put together a massive year of touring and I was totally like, this is it, done it, like dreams come true, I'm going to have a huge year, I've got two tracks that have both gone top 10 and yeah. popping and then um, obviously bang, um, the pandemic happened and all of the touring like yourself got cancelled that year and I was just like, yeah. oh, oh no, you know this kind of like moment I'd been like pushing for and waiting for, it felt like it, it kind of suddenly got taken away. Um, all those festivals, all those gigs that I was going to be doing, even the tour that I was on with Jax at the time got, got stopped. Yeah. And I was like, Oh no, obviously everyone was going through hard times and much, much harder times than, than me. Um, but my feelings at, at that time was, 
obviously just devastation because all my yeah, gigs that, I, that I've been excited about being pulled. But um, I, I definitely, though, I feel like I turned that period into a positive for myself because yeah, I because the next record I made was Head and Heart. I was going to say, yeah. And that came out in June, um, but I I was working on it for months and months. I, I worked on that tune for nearly a year, um, yeah. and I finished it during during COVID. And I, I do just wonder that if I had continued touring and done all those gigs that I had in the diary and gone and smashed 2020 and gone toured like mad off the back of Sorry and Lonely, I do wonder like if I had what would have happened with the next couple of records because I feel like having to take a step back and just think about music yeah and and not being out on the road and not you know because you know what tour and how tour and affects you it's, it's difficult to sometimes have clarity you know with totally. so many late nights and so much traveling but I was in a total like state of like complete focus and concentration on music at that point because I wasn't touring then um and I could just focus on finishing head and heart with M and EK and get it to the you know, to the place where I felt like it was perfect and just refine it and refine it and refine it until it was finally ready to release in June. And um, obviously that record like literally changed my life again. Um, and I to did another one, level. To, to another, another level. level. Yeah, because that was like a global hit record. Then yeah. it was it was, it was was like top of the charts across the world, not just in the yeah. UK. And Dude, um, it's done 1.14 billion streams. Like just to, just to like, <laughs> put that in context like the amount of people that the amount of artists that have a billion streams is unbelievable like it's such a small percentage i think it's like one percent of spotify actually earns a living from their music so like if you think one percent of spotify and then you've got probably 0.1 percent of that probably not even that have like one have a have records over a billion streams it's insane man it's fucking insane that song is like it's it's like magic what that that song did and 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 the way it kind of traveled around the world um and during a time as well when people were in lockdown i feel like that song actually was really good timing um, because it definitely Massively, yeah. gave people a positive uplift because it is such a positive feeling record. You know, it makes you yeah, feel good yeah. when you listen to it. It's still, it's my record. And even when I hear it for the most, <laughs> for the 10th billionth time that I've heard it, it still, it still puts a smile on my face. You know, it's just, it's just one of them records. And um, I know that if that had come out during a time when the world was open and clubs were going and festivals were going, obviously, I would have gone and toured like mad off the back of that tune. And yeah. people, people say to me, are, are you gutted that you released that record during lockdown? And I actually say, no, I'm not. Yeah. I look at it a total different way. I just, I, I get more pleasure of the fact that, you know, that that record meant a lot to people and helped people during the time because I've seen the messages. They're like that song. Yeah. It gave me, it made me feel good. You know, I put the radio on and I was feeling down that, that record really cheered me up. Um, and I get so much more like pleasure out of hearing that than being like, oh yeah, I could have, you know, gone and toured around the world and headlined this and that because of that tune. And I yeah. didn't because nothing was open. Um, well, I think also like, sorry to butt in there, but I also think like, and this is me not being disrespectful about the record, but I think you hit the nail on the head that timing is so key in this industry. Mm -hmm. And I think, during that time, 2020, June, like the sun, we, we had the hottest summer in England. Mm -hmm. It was like amazing, the weather during that first lockdown. I remember it was fucking amazing. But like streaming went up. Like mm -hmm. streaming was huge then comp in comparison to what it is now. Um, and sometimes I think timing is, timing is everything. But maybe if you released that record when you were touring and the world was open and everything, maybe it wouldn't have done as well. It would have done well. Let's be honest. It still would have done fucking amazing. But maybe it wouldn't have done that well as well as it is now. And maybe we'd be having a very different conversation now, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And I think that's the thing is like, it's so, it's so easy, easy to look at going, oh, I, I wish I released it when I was touring. I wish I did this. I wish I did that. Like, mate, I had my biggest record during COVID. Right, April, yeah. April 2020. Yeah. Well, I think June 
January 2020, I launched my label with You Take Me Higher. Mm -hmm. And then April 2020, Hallelujah came out. Yeah. And it's like, I technically should have been touring. Yeah. yeah. Like it, that record did crazy things for me, mm -hmm. but like it didn't. And, but again, in argument against that, if it wasn't locked down, maybe it wasn't, maybe it wouldn't have done so well. Yeah. That's the way I look at it totally, man. And, um, and yeah, and I think as well for myself, it was good that I was not on a, cause I think I, I'm the sort of person that would say like, yes to every single gig that I get offered yeah, as yeah. well. That's just the DJ inside of me. Like I want to, if I could DJ eight nights a week, I would. Mate, <laughs> like, same. Yeah, 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 um, same. So again, I, I, I from my side as well, I actually look back on it. I think it was it was probably a good thing that I wasn't able to, um, you know, that I was able just to stay focused on my music that whole summer. And yeah. you know, Head and Heart was such a a difficult record to follow up because of how big it was. And I knew that the next thing I had to do after Head and Heart, it had to, you know, it had to be great again. And and that's well, that what, was bad, right? That was bad, man. That was bad. Which is like Joe. <laughs> let's just let's just read this lineup. Joe Corey. Ray and David Guetta. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, Ray, quite possibly one of the best songwriters of our time. Yeah. In pop. Like, quite possibly. She, like, if we if we go into, like, what she's done over the years, like, Jesus fucking Christ, it's unbelievable. David Guetta doesn't really need any introduction. <laughs> like, I I know the back end, back story of, of, the, of that. You've told me on, on the DL, but... What's it like getting a call from David Guetta and saying I'm I'm going to be on the record with you? Yeah, it was it was, it was um, basically that. Like me and David had already started talking to each other because he he was a big fan of Head and Heart and yeah. he remixed it on his Jack Back alias. Yeah, and um, obviously David Guetta's like idol of mine. Been playing this mm. record since I was thirteen. Uh, yeah. he, like you said, this doesn't need any introduction. It's, it's David Guetta. Um, so I was having like FaceTimes with him and stuff. And I, I just couldn't believe it. It was like having a friendship with someone that I'd always, you know, been so inspired by and looked up to. Um, and then Ray was somebody that I really um, obviously wanted to work with so much. And we, the way, the way it all happened was I was in a studio session after Head and Heart with a songwriter called Jinjin who works with Ray a lot. Yeah. And Jinjin asked me if I wanted to hear some of Ray's demos. And I was like, oh, obviously, you know, I'd love, love to. <laughs> um, and she played me like 10 different demos. And the third one in was bed. And I remember because it was like, oh, okay, um, that's sick. Next one, next one. And then I heard bed and it was, it was the chorus of bed. And I just went, you know, instantly was like, wow, I love that. And I just thought straight away that feels like a hit record hook yeah yeah. and then like went to the next one i was like no 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 go back go back that's the one that's the one and that night i like slid into raise dms and was like i heard um this bed chorus i just love it i think it could be so great i'd really love to work on it and develop it with you and um yeah she replied back you know amazing i would love to do this with you let's get in the studio and then she said Sick. that that original like chorus she wrote um at david getter's house in yeah. ibifa um so then i dropped david an email um obviously we'd been chatting a little bit anyway and was like i've heard this bed chorus do you mind if i work on it with ray because in lockdown i was in the uk and obviously he was abroad so yeah i just started working on it and um with ray and and then hitting david back and forth letting him know what's going on and keeping him updated and you know that was a long process though i think yeah. i started working on that record in like june 2020 but I didn't finish it until like January, 2021. Wow. I was, again, again, it was just that like constant refinement and OCD on all the little details of the record. I mean, I must've driven Ray absolutely nuts because <laughs> <laughs> I was sending her like every version I was doing. At one point she was like, Joel, what is wrong with you? Like, <laughs> I've heard this about you. <laughs> <laughs> But, do you know but what? hey, like that's what it takes, right? Yeah, but and, and again, going back to the fact that I wasn't gone on the crazy tours around the world and I was able just to lock in fully on those records and be totally yeah. like consumed by them, it, it meant that I always got what I believed was the best result at the end. And yeah. you know, I, want, I was always striving for like perfection. Um, 
And I feel like that that focus and time that I had to put into the records allowed me to get to that. And I, I've noticed that since I am touring now like a madman and flying around everywhere, I, I need to try and work on that balance again to, to make sure I've got enough balance of music time and touring time. It's very difficult to, to get that balance, man. It's really hard. And I think what happens that a lot of artists can forget is that although, yes, we're successful some more than others in a career sense, but like we can get very caught up in the art of DJing and Mm -hmm. the art of touring around because that's realistically majority of where we earn our money. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe not when you're streaming a billion. No, no, it's true. It is. It is. Yeah. It's it's the case. And I think also the more successful you get, you get more money dangled in front of your eyes. And we're all, little boys and girls at the end of the day and going, oh my God, I can't believe I ever got an offer for that much money. Mm -hmm. If you know what I mean? And and it's like, it's very easy to get caught up in that. And I think it's very easy for artists to forget what got them to that point. And that's the music. Yeah. And, and it's the art. And I think it's, it's very, it's very easy to coast as an artist when you've got to a certain level, right? You could literally, you, you could probably not release music for the next two, three years and still be the Joel Corey of what you are now and earn just as much money and and just coast along in where you're at. But then again, I question myself is like, is that really, is that really what makes you happy? Yeah. It, it's so interesting to, to, to hear you say that because these are the thoughts that go around in my head all the time. And yeah. I've realized that I, I, what makes me happy is, is making amazing records yeah. that connect with people, that travel, that are hugely successful. That's actually what makes me happy. And um, I, it's a lesson that I've learned myself that I need to, like I said, regain that balance a bit more of touring to music where I, I can focus even more again on the music. And yeah deliver what I feel I can deliver and Mm. not be, um, you know, almost, um, affected too much by the heavy touring schedule. Yeah. Because I, I I miss, I miss having more time on the music and that is what makes me actually happy. And I, and I've realized that. It's it's interesting because I, so 20, 2021, no, 2022, I decided I was I was getting to the point where I was like really fed up with writing club records. Like I I just done COVID. I'd written so much music during mm-hmm. COVID. I think like 2020 I wrote 80 records. It's just like stupid. And then same in 2021. And then obviously we got back to it and coming to the end of 2021 I was like I'm over writing club records. Like I need something else in my life. I need to really like start writing something different. And 2022 was, I said to my manager, like, April, I'm carving out some time throughout the whole of the year to write an album. And that's not just going to be club records. It's like an actual album. And for me, the whole of last year, so I did, I, I set, I gave myself a year. I said, so April 2022 to April 2023, I'm going to have a a complete album. And I did it. Um, And then took a while to say it's coming out this year. But for me, it's really strange because usually coming into a new year, 2024, I'd have 20 club records ready to play. But because I've just been working on an album, I've not written any club records. For right. myself. I've written for other people. I've not written any rec- club records for myself, which is weird because I then go to my DJ sets and I'm like, fuck, <laughs> you, you're lazy. Like, yeah, yeah I, I forget that I wrote like 50 odd records, 50, 60 records for the album. And it, it's a whole different project, but it goes back to what you were saying. The, the feeling of having to write music and to like, listen to that music and go, Oh shit, I fucking love this process. Mm-hmm. And, and I love that waking up in the morning going, I'm going to the studio today and I don't know what the fuck's going to happen. Mm-hmm. But even, even if it's not a good day in the studio, it's one step closer to having a fucking amazing day in the studio and maybe that comes out with the fucking biggest hit record in the world or maybe it comes out with something that i love that no one else likes yeah don't give a fuck it's just that process right yeah and 
like that's this year, February. Um, I've taken February basically off touring just to nice, be back same. in the studio, and and um, this is something that I haven't done enough of in the last couple of years because the touring's been so heavy, and I've had to like kind of squeeze in the studio stuff in between touring, which has made it really stressful and not as enjoyable. And um, you know, maybe I feel like. I could have got better results if I prioritized things differently. Um, yeah. Like last year, I got released my album, and bringing that together during a time where I was doing so many gigs, yeah, the stress, I, honestly, the sleepless nights, the non-stop sort of like um, you know stressing over stuff, it almost made the process unenjoyable. And um, and yet, yeah, of course, like we want to earn money. And like you said, the DJ inside of us wants to play all the different gigs and you get all the offers and you're like, want to say yes to everything. But I've learned that that balance needs, needs to be so much better for myself this year. Otherwise totally, it's, you just don't enjoy it. So this episode comes out February the 23rd. And so you would have had your month off. So hopefully you've written some hit records <laughs> yeah. this, during this month. <laughs> but if, like note on that i have all of february off as well so we should definitely get this yeah 100 percent. i'd love to get stuff on that couch <laughs> just get mate get sleeping you're not an a-class dj now you're back on the couch <laughs> um so i want to before we get to the album because i'm coming to the album yeah. for you um out out was your next record yep that Joel Corey, Joel Corey, Jax Jones, Charlie XXS, and Sweetie. Yeah, Sweetie. Yeah. Yeah, Sweetie. Yeah. Um, 473 million streams. Mental. And that record um, is a sample of uh, Strome, A Laws and Dance, which yeah. I absolutely loved that record. I used to play it when I was younger, and it was a, it was a sample that I always wanted to uh, work on. And I actually had that out, out demo all the way back when I just finished Sorry. Um, yeah. So I, I had that sort of on the hard drive for ages, um, a very sort of undeveloped version of it. And um, me and Jax have become really good mates. Um, obviously, like, I, I supported him on his tour just before lockdown. And um, we were like really good mates, wanted to work on music together. Um, and we were just chatting about tracks during lockdown and setting each other different ideas. and. I sent him that out, out demo. I was like, mate, do you know this sample? And he straight away was like, I love this track so, so much. And I was like, oh my God, this is the one. We should do this together. You know, it just felt right. Um, yeah. like it kind of lived in both of our worlds as well. And um, I love the concept of um, <laughs> the whole out, out concept as well, kind of fitted perfect with just coming out of lockdown. So it, good. It was like, all right, this is the tune that everyone's going to go back out, out. <laughs> <laughs> um so it kind of worked for the time as well you know it was that record to get everyone back back on the dance floor um and you know when charlie xx jumped on it and sweetie and um yeah it just become like a really fun record um yeah. with us all together and and it came out you know that was after bed then and again straight into the top 10 in like week two or three so it was like that track was like a rocket man we literally released mm. it and it just went straight away um, it's amazing how the records do that right and how like you were saying like sorry at the beginning was like a slow burn oh that was such a slow burner i i'd, I'd already was about to release another record um yeah. because i was about i was actually getting lonely teed up to release i just thought i didn't think sorry was working yeah yeah but it, it yeah it's such a slow burner but then yeah compared obviously to other records that just go straight just, in just do it it's amazing and the thing is is that i i really respect the more commercial world like the world that you're in because they actually work records record labels actually work them whereas in the more underground world i feel like if your record doesn't or it's 100 percent the case if your record is isn't connecting within the first couple of weeks it gets forgotten about mm -hmm. and i think because obviously in the commercial world like it takes longer for these records to connect it's harder to get radio it's harder to get like the, the big playlist but because there's way more invested in it these records have to be worked for a long period of time mm -hmm. and i think it, it it's a really i think it's something that the underground or the less commercial side of the industry can really learn from the the record labels the majors realistically because i think it's a it's a it's a strict business for them it is we release music 
mm-hmm. that's all they do whereas i think more in the underground world it's like you it's more so a brand for the artist yeah than than about releasing records in the grand scheme of things mm-hmm. which is an interesting concept yeah it's, it's, there's a lot to like dive into with it um I feel as well, obviously, it's like two different approaches because with, with the underground world, you, you're really relying on like DJ support as well um, Massively. to gain that, that buzz around those records um, more now than ever, especially with TikTok and everything. Some of these club records are like the biggest records just off DJs spinning them and clips of it going yeah. around and suddenly up DJ jump on it and want to play it. And yeah. um and it's like with, with the sort of major label, la- label and the commercial approach, they will they will get behind a record, but if it doesn't react, yeah. they will they will step away from it. They will yeah. step away, and I, I do think with a major label, they, they, there's obviously like a lot of positives, but the negatives is there's so much pressure on that record that it needs to work. One hundred percent. 100 percent how do you cope with that pressure it's hard i'm not gonna lie like it doesn't get easier either um it's really difficult mate to be honest to be honest bro um you know especially when there's so many people involved as in like um you know your radio team the label team, um, the other artists that you're collaborating with, there, it does build up this huge amount of pressure of like, this record has to be a hit. And um, yeah. I feel like in today's world, things are becoming so much harder to um, get records to connect without having some sort of luck on a viral yeah. aspect. So it's it's even harder now to, to, to get them away. Um, so yeah, there's an extreme amount of pressure, and and uh, how do you deal with it? You just, I just think you've got to believe that you've done your part to the best of your ability, and yeah. you know you love you love what you've done. You've worked as hard as you can, and you just got to keep reminding yourself that that it's kind of once you've put it out there, it's you kind of not got that much control anymore, and and what mm. will be will be. So. I, yeah, I I agree with you, but I think also as artists, although we shouldn't, especially if you listen to Rick Rubin, like he's like the guru of like no expectations, but like I'd be lying if I didn't have, ex- if I said I didn't have expectations when I release a record. I, I, for me to say that I don't have a single expectation when I release a record is utter bullshit. What is a failure to you? with a record because your failure is going to be way yeah your failure is going to be somebody else's hit record right yeah purely because you've had record streaming a billion half a bill like million hundreds of millions right mm-hmm. what is it what how do you record success of your records and is that streams is that radio plays what is that yeah, I think I think my my outlook on it has changed a little bit over the last couple of years, but definitely off the back of like once I had like five top ten records in a row, such like a crazy role to go yeah. on. This <laughs> is <laughs> mad. <laughs> um, after that, it was like anything that doesn't go top ten in the charts for me, it was painful yeah it hurt bro like it really and the way i am as well i'm very competitive you know like and yeah yeah um again it goes back to that sort of like obsessive sort of like um mindset and strive for perfection when something doesn't come off in my head it really really hurts um but i've learned to deal with that so back then it would be like if this didn't go top 10 like this is a fail um Mm. but then i started to realize that there's so much more to to it than just getting a top 10 you know um for example like i did a record with tom grennan called lionheart right yeah and that record like uh peaked at 17 or 18 in the chart but that record i know meant a lot to a lot of people and like had a very like um 
connected broadly and yeah. and really like as i said connected with people and had a really positive effect on people and when i go around and play that record like there's such a huge reaction and there's and i think like this is this is so much more than just like a chart a chart record like this this is yeah. a song that people really love and we did something like special together on this um so i kind of think that you know off the i started to realize that you know if it doesn't go top 10 it isn't a failure at all yeah that's crazy thinking um but that's what that's what my mindset was like um a few years ago um what do i think a failure is now oh what would i say a failure is um i i honestly don't look at it that way anymore i really I, I really don't bro i don't look at anything now as long as i believe that i did the best i could at the time um yeah. i don't look at any sort of like chart positions as a failure because i just think Love it's that. so difficult now to judge what is gonna um move in the charts because because of the way the industry is now though and, and there's yeah. so many moving parts in play and it's kind of it's like a lottery now isn't it <laughs> Mate, it's it's changed so much in the last year. Yeah, like it really just, has just just a year. Like it's changed, and especially from from twenty twenty, it's like well, like the streaming world is worlds apart from what it was. Yeah, the amount of people listening has changed completely. How people listen has changed. Like the like how quickly things change as well. I was watching. I was in the studio the other day, and I was watching some crazy person made like a YouTube video of all of Max Martin's hits. Mm -hmm. And it was like a chart, a moving chart of like how long records stayed in the top 10. Yeah. For. And it was just like going up and down and like back in the like nineties, early two thousands, there'd be records that was be in the top 10 for months. Yeah. Right. And now it's like, but they started low. Okay. So it almost did what, what, sorry did for you yeah right so it started low and it would slowly go up stay at the top be in the top 10 for a few weeks dropped slowly dropped down whereas all of his modern day stuff starts at number 10 yeah. may go up and then just fucking drops out yeah unless it's been like a viral hit on tiktok which was one of them it was a weekend record that was i can't remember with which record it was let me pull it up um it was the weekend um the oh, i can't remember blinded blinded lights mm -hmm. it was that fucking house done four billion streams that is mental um and but but because that was a viral hit on tiktok that stayed at like number one in the top in the u.s charts for like two months which is crazy but then it dropped off but like what i'm seeing is that things start high and drop off straight away mm -hmm. and and i think that's the, the the we we can't even compare times of the industry from three years ago yeah yeah because it's changed it's changed so much and I, I and like back then sort of like 2019 2020 i had like a, like a stone cold sort of formula um yeah and even the way that we ran campaigns, like it, it was like a slick operation that I'd got down to a T and with yeah. my team. Um, but now it's like, it's like anyone's game out there. Like these, some of these records that um, just pick up momentum on TikTok and, you know, go, go top 10. It's like, how did, how did that happen? Like, how, yeah. how, how do you make that happen? And, and the thing, the thing is you can't, there, there's no way yeah. of like making that happen. There's no real formula about it. It's kind of just some sort of like mysterious magic luck that happens or timing or whatever. And, you, and, Which, and nowadays you, you, you just, even the record labels don't know, bro. They, no one, no one knows how it happens now. It's scary, right? It's scary. And like, I think. I, I I know that I'm lucky that I kind of um, got myself like through the door at a yeah. time before all this really had so much influence. Um, yeah, I think it's really hard now to for an artist to break themselves to be like mm -hmm. consistently having hits. One hundred. Very very difficult to like you know to be on a sort of roll like that. 
because this, yeah. as I said, as I said, there's so many moving parts now and so many different factors in play for that need to work for a record to become a hit. And you can't control them or judge them or really have much influence on them. It's just kind of got to be a bit of like that viral luck involved in it. So, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah and it, no, I, very hard. I now. agree. It's super hard. And I think it's the same. It's, I, I also believe it's, say, it's the same in like the more underground side of things mm-hmm. as well. Is like less DJs are playing DJs' records. They're all playing their own records. Mm-hmm. And the only videos they post is their own records. Like before, it was very much about promoting other people's music and like just a big record that's popping off. Everyone plays it. But like I speak about this a lot with other other artists, like in the more underground space. And we haven't had like Ibiza summer hit, like the one record that everyone plays since like Camel Fat and mm. Cola. I don't think there's been one in the like underground scene where that that's happened. And it's just a sign of the times. It's just very, it's a very different time to be an artist. Yeah. A hundred percent. And um, anyone that figures it out. <laughs> Let us know. <laughs> um, I want to talk about another Friday night, which is your debut album, which came out last year. Um, it happened to be the biggest selling dance music record or dance music album of 2023. How's that, mate? Oh, yeah, it's incredible. You know, that I don't think like, um, you know, DJs and sort of commercial dance music artists don't really do albums. Um, it's, yeah. it's not a, that much of a common thing anymore. Um, so, you know, to be honest, like it's, it's a great stat to have like, you know, the highest selling dance album, but it, t- truthfully, there's not a lot of competition because it's not that common anymore. That's the truth. Like people don't really do them anymore because it's such a, yeah. a singles and streaming market. And my, my album is predominantly like, all my records from the last um, couple of years, plus all my new music that I made in 2023. So yeah. like some people were like, oh, your album's like, like a greatest hit because it's got, you know, it's, 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 got, <laughs> it's got records on it. Like, you know, all the way back to Sorry and Lonely, but I, yeah. I just didn't want to leave any of those songs off. It felt weird to like put my first album out about all those records that, mm. you know, with, which really gave me my break. Um, yeah. But yeah, so in that sense, this album has been in the works for four or five years. And, um, you know, me and the label were having a lot of conversations of like, do we even, should we even do this? But I, I really what personally wanted to do it. I wanted to yeah. have that body of work that I could look back on and be like, that was the first chapter of my music career. You know, that was, that was all those records in one body, um, in one playlist that I could just present. And, um, at the start of the year, I was like, we are doing this. I was like, 2023, this is the year that we are doing it. So uh, we got a plan in place and spent a lot, of, a lot, a lot of work and a lot of time and effort to bring that project together. It's not easy bringing an album. No. There's so much behind the scenes work that has to go into it. Um, yeah. But it was all worth it. It was difficult doing it during the time when I was touring like crazy as well. Like we said earlier, you know, it was, it was very stressful, um, but I'm delighted with the result. And, you know, I'm just so happy that I've done that. And now I can approach this year with like a fresh, clean slate in my mind and ready to work on new totally. music. And I feel like I've closed that first chapter now. Yeah, it's, it is almost like a chapter, right? Of like mm-hmm. all the Joel Corey hits plus new ones. Yeah. And mate, it's fucking done well yeah if i'm look, i'm literally looking at it now and you're like every record on there has done well yeah it's crazy it's absolutely crazy oh thanks man um the artwork's sick as well it's like <laughs> classic 90s yeah. boy band boy band look yeah I fucking love it <laughs> <laughs> so good so good man um talking of 2024 um, I've seen you've just announced Ibiza residency, Ibiza rocks. Am I right in? Yeah, it's my, it's actually my fourth year, um, doing the Wednesdays there at Ibiza rocks. Um, and listen, like, you know, I think every DJ always wants to get to Ibiza. I mean, I did, yeah. you know, all those years that I was, um, having my residencies in other resorts, you know, the Greek islands and, and Mallorca and stuff in my mind, I was always like, 
one day I just need to get to Ibiza because I was going there as a raver yeah. since I was 18. Now, every year, me and the boys would go to Ibiza. It's, it's, it was like my favorite place in the world. My best memories were always made in Ibiza. And uh, eventually, you know, um, partnered with Ibiza Rocks to get my get my night out there. And this is this is the fourth year of it. So we're building it every single year. It's getting bigger and bigger. And it's a, it's a great home for me. And it's been a good home for me for the last few years. Nice. Yeah, it's... um. Ibiza is an interesting place now. I'm sure you've been going there for years, so you've seen the change. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's it's amazing what Ibiza Rocks has done over the years and how it kind of has like evolved into what it is now. And it's like the place in San Antonio to go, right? Yeah, and and you know it, it works great for me because um, it allows me to add like a performance aspect to the. Um, event as well so you know all these collaborations i've had with different artists i'm able to bring them out and perform these songs live um you know during my dj set and i always play like an extended set three hours long which gives me the opportunity to show what i can do as a dj so it's you know people come because they you know are fans of those radio pop records but then it gives me the chance to play my more underground stuff that i love and and really take the crowd on the journey and and that's why it works great for me i think it's um and it's also a day party so i'm in bed by 11 p.m (laughs) it's so perfect i love those parties oh mate (laughs) i played i played uh, in on new year's day i played chicago and it was a day party and i was like oh my god i fucking wish every set was like this yeah it's it's nice to get that proper night sleep in and and um yeah it's definitely as i'm getting older (laughs) i'm definitely um (laughs) I'm definitely like valuing those day sets a lot more. <laughs> yeah, I bet, man. How's the uh, how's the fitness going at the moment? <laughs> yeah, fitness is going good. Um, I've actually just about to uh, um announcing um, that I'm joining uh, C4, um, who cool, are um, you know a big um, sports supplement brand, and I've been working yeah. with them for the last year, but we're aff- going official now. And um, Sick. yeah, so I'm I'm great. So what are you going to be doing with them? So I'm going to be um, basically part of their team now so um i always i always have used their products since i was a teenager um that's why yeah. to be honest with you like i have had offers with other brands over the last few years but I, i've waited because i wanted to do do it a genuine thing that i actually believe in and felt right totally. and you know c4 is a brand that i actually love i'm a huge fan of and use their products um yeah so yeah just partnering with them means i'm going to be part of their team um doing events with them um obviously promoting their products and telling people about them letting them know them um making my followers and fans aware of 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 the stuff they put out and and what they do and creating some cool content together um that's cool so yeah it's it's been going really well mate you know fitness is a big passion of mine you know in my 20s i took it a lot more seriously and was doing the competitions which you know all about you've seen the pictures (laughs) Don't Google it. No one Google the pictures, please. <laughs> Mate, I, I, so I remember, I think it was our last session that we did together here. You were about to do a show, like a fitness show, mm-hmm. I think in in a week's time, and you were literally like starving yourself yeah. and you could barely walk. And I was like, dude, that is dedication. But you were like, this is my absolute last time I'm ever doing it. Yeah, wow. Um, that's crazy, man. Yeah, that was all the yeah. way back then. I, I mean, doing those competitions, right? nothing will ever be more physically and mentally challenging for me than that because that was like yeah four months of intense training and dieting and like you said going almost to the point where you're you feel like you're starving um yeah yeah and it, well you are starving. you're starving man you're in such a calorie <laughs> deficit and you've got to push through yeah. and kind of get that mental resilience to get through those preparations and what actually has happened is later in my life now sort of in this new era of my life in the music industry, the sort of um, discipline that I had to go through those competitions has, has helped me so much. 100%. In the music industry, um, with my touring, with just the pr- dealing with the pressure of everything that's going on. Um, I just think that doing those actual fitness competitions really, really helped me build up that sort of resilience. And um, yeah, I'd never, I, I don't want to do one again because they're so grueling. Um, but I'm glad, I'm glad I've done them. And fitness is still a big hobby of mine and a big passion and, and part of my daily routine. Well, it's, I think it's part of your career as well. I think it's like you, you always look fucking amazing. Like it's, 
it's part of your brand right yeah yeah i would say that's true and and um it's kind of cool you know a lot of people come see me dj and after i've set they'll they'll ask me questions about fitness <laughs> which is yeah. which is really nice man um and hopefully you know some of the fitness i've done has inspired people to help them with their fitness journeys which is the yeah. most important thing and for myself there's obviously a lot of physical benefits fits with it but there's a much much bigger mental benefit for me um mm. for keeping on top of my fitness and my diet and it really you know puts a spring in my step and helps me have that mental clarity when it comes to my djing and music production yeah i think it's really key um like for me i'm nowhere near at the level of where you are with training but like i train every day <laughs> and it's so important for me it keeps my it keeps my brain not in the pits yeah. really like if i if i don't train i get so negative Same. so negative yeah. it's, it's an interesting would would you ever like do more in fitness again well i think now that i'm kind of working with c4 like there's going to be a lot more fitness related content that i'm going to be working on this this year which is what i want to do yeah and i feel like now i've got um you know a team that i can uh take it to the next level and really yeah. like do some cool stuff with so i'm excited about that um my main focus though is my music and my dj and, and it always will be yeah. and that was always my number one dream and passion and mm. to sort of keep this going with my music and my dj and i actually need to work even harder this year and be even more focused yeah, yeah, so yeah. nothing is going to distract me off that path um that. but yeah my fitness is 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 obviously um you know still a huge thing for me and um i'm looking forward to working with c4 but you know I, I, my djing and music is always going to be that number one for me yeah i agree man i agree 2024 plans musically what have we got so i it, i'm in a strange position here where i haven't actually got i've got club records ready to go so in february i'm releasing like three club records uh, but as yeah. far as the radio sort of more pop commercial releases I, I, I've, I've got kind of a clean slate right now. And the other thing is Sick. what's nice is I'm not under any pressure to rush a release out because I've just done the album yeah. and that's still got like its legs to, to go on this year. So I'm just going to just go in the studio and um, have fun, see what feels good, not rush anything out. And when I feel like I've got that killer record, yeah. then I'll flick the switch. But I'm under no pressure right now to get to like jump into a big sort of commercial campaign or anything i can yeah i'm gonna have some fun with some club records that are more beatport focused um which i've been playing on my dj sets that i've been waiting to release for a while and yeah i guess just see when i feel like i i have something that i i think is killer and that i love then it'll be time but i can honestly say i don't have it right now i'm just in the studio gonna have some fun and experiment are you still in your major deal yeah so um the album was um, the end of the first term. Yeah. Um, and now we go into the sort of the next second. Yeah. The, the next option with Atlantic. So, you know, I love Atlantic. They've been such a great yeah. team for me. They're like my family. Um, so I'm so happy to continue working with them and excited. It's nice to have that. Yeah. It's nice to hear that because so many artists just fucking hate the label <laughs> that they work with. Yeah. You, you hear some horror stories and like, um, but I am very lucky to have a great team at Atlantic. And like I said, they are literally the family to me. And we've achieved so much as a team. And um, I'm looking forward to continuing our journey together. Sick, man. Well, let's wrap this up. Dude, I'm so proud of you, man. It's like from 2017 to now, your your career, your life has changed massively. And it's all down to you working really fucking hard. And so like, keep it up, man. Keep it up. I'm really excited to see what, what comes comes out of it. Oh, thanks so much, bro. Like you know you know me from the start man so it's always special when we catch up and i love meeting up with you when one's four as well um likewise man and bro um get me back on that sofa <laughs> <laughs> and oh, yeah, I, I miss your cooking as well mate i, I know, remember right? those meals you used to cook me bro they, that was the best part <laughs> weren't weren't good for the abs put it that way <laughs> no mate have a great year um i'm sure i'll see you soon but keep in touch and i'll catch you soon we'll do bro big love that is a wrap big love to Joel for coming on big love to listening uh i hope you enjoyed it please share it please give us a subscribe give us some comments and uh see you next time